Greetings everyone and welcome to lecture 24. This is Worm Gears. So lecture 24 is part of chapter 7. Uh, we will be covering helical gears in a separate lecture and covering bevel gears in lecture 25. So Worm Gears. Worm gears are an interesting topic. You can see a picture of one here on the screen. They're used with high power transmission in mind and generally have extremely large gear reductions. You can see a couple of interesting features about worm gears here. First off, this screw looking thing on the top is called the worm. The other portion, oddly enough, is called the gear. Sometimes the worm gear. Uh, you can see that in this case, the gear has a cup shape to its teeth. Here we're looking at it on the end. That's called an enveloping gear. And what it does is kind of go around a little bit to get more contact with the worm. This is for greater strength. In most cases with worm gears, the worm is what is driving the system. This is a high friction setup. As I mentioned, it's an extremely large gear reduction in most cases. The friction in this kind of setup is generally enough that you can't back drive the system, meaning you can't turn the gear and therefore cause the worm to turn. This is not always the case, so don't use that as a given. Sometimes, particularly when you have vibration in the system, you can get the worm to turn if you're applying some kind of a torque to the gear. Here's a picture that we're going to uh, work with as we go through these. Uh, I would suggest that when you download these notes you may want to zoom in on the picture or take a look at it in your book. But we'll note a couple of uh, just definitions here in order to talk about things. So first off, axial pitch. This is the distance from a point on one tooth to the corresponding point on the adjacent tooth, and it's measured along the axis of the worm gear. That's the horizontal line here. So this is equivalent to the circular pitch on a spur gear. You're measuring from a point on one tooth to the corresponding point on the next. The axial pitch of the worm gear must match the circular pitch of the meshing gear if the shaft axes are 90 degrees apart. This of course points something out. The shaft axes on a worm gear system do not have to be 90 degrees apart. In most cases they are, but they do not have to be. The next thing we're looking at here is called the lead. You can see the lead down here towards the bottom of the picture. This is the apparent axial distance, meaning along the horizontal, that the thread advances in one revolution of the worm. You can have a multi-lead system or single. If you have a single thread, the lead is equal to the axial pitch. In this picture, since the lead is obviously significantly longer than the pitch, this has more than one thread. In a double thread system, the lead is equal to two times the axial pitch. When you look at these systems, there are going to be a couple of things definition-wise that we look at. We already looked at the axial pitch piece of W. The lead is identified with L. N sub W is the number of teeth on the worm. And if you happen to have a metric system, M sub W is the module of the worm. The worm also has its own pitch diameter, labeled as D sub W, and then it has two angles that are associated with it. The helix angle, psi sub W, and the lead angle, lambda. These two angles are complementary to each other. So Psi sub W plus lambda is equal to 90. The worm gear and the mating gear will have the same hand helix, but different helix angles. And the worm lead angle is the complement of that helix angle. We can also associate via trigonometry the pitch diameter with the lead and the lead angle, 
if we go back and take a look at this, you can see that that helix angle is the angle of the tooth with the axis. The lead angle is the angle of the tooth from the vertical to the axis. Center distance for a worm gear system is exactly what you would expect. It's the pitch diameter of the worm plus the pitch diameter of the gear divided by two. Velocity ratio for worm gear sets are exactly the same as the velocity ratio for any other gear set. But because we have these relationships between the lead and the axial pitch, we can use a varying set of equations to figure out additional things. So please pay attention to these relationships. Worm gear forces are quite similar to helical gear forces, which we'll talk about in the helix lecture. When you have a worm gear, it is generating an axial force, a tangential force, and a radial force. So the worm has axial, tangential, and radial. The gear also has axial, tangential, and radial. The radial forces always work to push the gears apart. But note in this case that the axial force on the worm is the tangential force on the gear. The tangential force on the worm is the axial force on the gear. So we need to note that when we calculate forces on a worm or a gear in a worm gear set, that we have to identify whether those tangential forces are occurring on the gear or on the worm. Torques are very easy to compute. Again, we just take the relevant tangential force multiplied by the pitch radius, and that would go for both the worm and the gear. We have some additional references on worm gears. They're fairly easy to understand, but please feel free to hit these. There's some interesting stuff there. We will discuss worms, and I will bring in a sample later on in the term.